Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Endometriosis Family Support Group webinar series. My name is Megan Elder, and I'm the program coordinator with the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation. And we're really excited that you're all joining us tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce our speaker. She's going to talk, and then at the end, we'll have a little Q&A portion. So if you see a little box up on the side that says Q&A, at any point, you can type your questions in there, and then we'll go ahead and ask her at the end. So our speaker tonight is Paige Gibbons. And she is half of the podcast, The Uterus and the Deuterus, where they talk about chronic pain and her experiences with endometriosis. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass presenting right to her. All right. So hopefully you guys can see my screen and hear me. Um, my name is Paige Gibbons, and I am going to be talking about living with endometriosis, and I'm calling it the secret life of suffering. Um, for many reasons that I will get into. But first, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. So I've had endometriosis for about 12 years, along with chronic migraine disorder. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> having endometriosis and chronic migraines or another disease along with endometriosis is very common. Um, I am the co-host and producer of a podcast called The Uterus and the Deuterus. We are a humor-based podcast. Um, we do have that explicit warning on iTunes because sometimes when I'm talking about endo, I have to drop an F-bomb because it's that painful, as I'm sure you can relate to. And my podcast is all about living with endometriosis and chronic migraines and how I do that. Um, and I do it with my friend who is a guy. His name is Nick. Um, and we've been friends since I was five. So it, there's a lot of humor in it. We try to kind of laugh instead of cry through being chronically ill, if you will. Um and then I also have a YouTube channel that addresses more of the emotional, mental, and spiritual side of battling chronic illness called Fireside Chats with the Uterus. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm coughing a lot, guys. I'm up in Northern California where, like, everything is on fire, which is absolutely heartbreaking. So the smoke is just causing me to cough a lot this past week. So I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, so right now my podcast and my YouTube channel, they are on hiatus. Um, because I'm about to have a very invasive um, migraine procedure. And if anyone does have migraines, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, nothing's really off limits with me if you've ever listened to my podcast. Um, I also run an Instagram page. I can be found at, at Page the Uterus and a Facebook page. If you go into Facebook and just put in the uterus and the deuterus, you can find us on Facebook and also uterusdeuterus.com. And I just wanted to share this because I think that having – a community when you're chronically ill is insanely important, and I will be talking about that later. So let's get into things here. <clears throat> so you have endo, super fun disease, right? No, absolutely not. Um, so this is kind of my outline for what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, the first thing I'm going to let, talk about is the importance of doing research. Endometriosis is commonly misdiagnosed, and when doctors do diagnose it, they unfortunately have, sometimes have very little information about um, what what endo actually is and how it should be treated and how much it will affect your life. And I went after my first endometriosis surgery, I did no research. I literally was like, oh, I'm fine. And like, I was not even like a little bit. Um, and it took me a while to join the endometriosis community and do research. That brings me to my next point, join a community. If you're not a part of an online support system, get there. It is so insanely important. <clears throat> when I found the hashtag on Instagram, Endo Sisters, back in, this was summer of 2015, it changed my entire life. I was so isolated. I was so lonely in my illness. And the internet communities really changed my, the way I view myself and my illness and like how I could connect to people. Um, which is really, really important because you can feel very lonely. And unfortunately, sometimes your friends and your family, your loved ones don't understand what it's like to be chronically ill, <clears throat> which brings me to this. Sit down with your family and friends and talk about endo. Endo is a very complicated disease, right? Because it's not properly diagnosed or because your doctor doesn't give you enough information, it can be really hard for you, your family, and your friends to understand what the hell is going on with your body. And I have been in situations where people don't understand, you know, I've lost friendships over it. And even my own dad, he had a really hard time understanding what was going on because like, I didn't know what was going on. And when I finally sat down and explained to him everything that was going on and, you know, outlined the disease, he was like, 
oh my gosh, I had no idea. Like, let's do everything to get you better. And now he's like a huge advocate of endometriosis and it's awesome. So I'm going to talk about what endo is, how to treat it, what treatment looks like, and then kind of like living with the disease, um, but doing it in a way to kind of expose our secret life of pain so that we can get more support and more treatment <clears throat> because clearly that's needed. So what is endo? So you probably know what endo is. I don't know if any loved ones are checking in, but I thought, you know, let's go over it, right? It's an autoimmune disease for the endometrium tissue, right? Inside of your uterus, growth outside of your uterus into the body cavity. The most common symptom are extremely painful periods. Um, <clears throat> also here I have in my slide talking about not just abdominal pain, but lower back pain and pain that will shoot down into your legs. I get that a lot. That's very common. Pain with intercourse, pain with bowel movements and urination. You can experience that a lot during your period, or if you're lucky like me, even half your period, excessive bleeding. Very important to talk to your doctor about excessive bleeding because women can often pass out from the amount of their bleeding. Um, <clears throat> infertility is unfortunately very common, as well as other symptoms. And I didn't want to devote you know, too many slides to this because I think everyone understands, but other symptoms are extremely important, especially when understanding how endometriosis affects like all aspects of your life and how it might look different in all of us, which is a problem, right? We're presenting differently to doctors and to the world. And so that can make people be like, wait, what's going on? Very frustrating. So fatigue, fatigue is a big one. And this is not like your friend being like, oh my God, I partied last night and we slept for four hours. No, this is nothing like that. As you know, the, the fatigue with endometriosis is painful and it just sucks the life out of you. It's like there's a dementor over you sucking the life out of you. Um, so if you've been getting that and you're like, what is this? That is endo fatigue. Diarrhea and constipation, right? Opposites, but extremely common. And any kind of, you know, inflammation of the body, the, the abdominal cavity down there is going to hurt your endo. And that's very common with um, the diarrhea and constipation. And next is bloating. So bloating you can have bloating like, oh, man, I ate a burrito. But then there's also endo belly bloating, which is where your abdomen and endo belly is like a great useful term. Um, it's where your abdomen distends because y your endo is inflamed. So you can get cramping, extreme pressure, discomfort, nausea. And I find at least for myself, the, bl the bloating and fatigue are like best friends and usually happen together. Um, nausea, super common, um, especially during your period, but also not during your period. I mean, personally, I have to take the prescription anti-nausea Zofran pretty often. Um, and there's a difference. There can be like that slow burn nausea, and then the my cramps are so bad, I'm vomiting uncontrollably nausea. And that's all endo. <clears throat> all right. But you don't look sick. So endometriosis is an invisible illness, which makes it so hard for family and friends and doctors and even ourselves to understand because you can't see it. And yes, it is getting more recognized, but it's often misdiagnosed. Like a lot of people will be diagnosed with IBS instead of endo. And a lot of people have IBS and endo. So everything gets so messy down there, which can make it really hard for us to navigate living with this and explaining to other people because you sometimes just don't know what's going on with your body and you can't physically see it. Um, and so, you know, I just encourage you to surround yourself with compassionate and understanding people who get, you know, what we're talking about here. So the ebb and flow of endo, this is something I really wanted to talk about because endometriosis can be insanely inconsistent. Like you might have a time where being on the birth control pill works for you for like six months or a year, you know, maybe when you're younger and your endo hasn't had as much time to grow or something. And then suddenly it's breaking through and it's horrible. And then you have this surgery and you feel great for a year. And then the endometriosis is back and you might be barfing in bed for three weeks. And then suddenly you can fly to Hawaii. And for some people, the pain is constant and there's no letting up. And for some people, it ebbs and flows. And I just want to talk about this because it makes it so frustrating, especially when you're trying to navigate things with like a boss and a job, um, or if you have kids, or if you're married, or your friends. And so under wrapping your own head around that can help you uh, wrap other people's heads around that, for lack of a better term, um, and just try to open an open dialogue about that. And I also encourage you guys to never give up. Even if your endo is just driving you up the wall, and nothing is working, there's always a next step to be done. And I know it is so exhausting to be in pain like all the time. Like 
I barely work right now because of my pain, but every day, like I have a choice to try and continue to fight this and to find answers for myself and, you know, explore a new doctor. Um, but it can be very, very emotionally taxing. And I wanted to talk specifically about that. So I want to talk about chronic pain and self judgment, because I see this over and over again, people sending me emails or commenting or just talking about their disease on the internet. People judge themselves and they beat themselves up for being chronically ill. And I think that part of surviving being chronically ill and not giving into it is taking care of yourself emotionally and mentally as well. I think that is insanely important. And I went through, you know, years of just loathing myself and hating myself and judging myself for being sick. Um, but, you know, we didn't choose the end of life. It chose us. And so I really encourage you guys to not judge yourself for being sick or for having a flare or for having to go to the ER again. And to, I, it's so hard to love our bodies um, when they torture us all the time. But I really encourage you guys to try and love your body and to bring people into your life who can support you in that and who don't get angry with you or yell at you for being sick because I've been in situations like that and um, it's terrible and it makes you kind of loathe yourself when really you should be loving yourself, cheering yourself on because you're this like amazing warrior. I'm very into acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, you can Google that and download worksheets and it's all about accepting your reality, right? Accepting that you're sick and then committing to working on it. And every day when I wake up, I accept the fact I'm sick and I commit to working on it. I also highly encourage you guys to do a gratitude practice. There are so many studies saying that if you do a gratitude practice for 21 days, you can actually start to rewire your brain because it's so easy to be anxious and depressed having this illness. I mean, I I get I have terrible anxiety and I get I suffer with depression because of this, you know, being chronically ill and having chronic pain and being kind of like feeling like you're shut off from the rest of the world. And so a daily gratitude practice can take like literally two minutes. All you do is write down three things you're thankful for. And it can be like, I'm thankful I have soft jammies on. Like you don't have to get all deep and, you know, philosophical. And if you do that every day for 21 days, you know, neuroscience has proven there is a difference. And I, I didn't stop after the 21 days. I keep going um, because we need hope in our lives. And then finally, you know, Cultivate a healthy and like-minded support system. That is so important to do. It's so important to have that support, whether it's in person or online. You know, reach out because you are worth it. You are fighting such an intense battle, and you are totally worth not being judged and loving yourself and finding people that can do that with you. So let's get into more the more practical side. So treatment. There are two different kinds of surgeries to treat endometriosis. And um, I'm using the word treat loosely here. So there's ablation surgery and excision surgery. Ablation surgery is what your general OBGYN surgeon run of the mill is going to do. And that is where they cut you open and they use like a soldering iron basically to burn off the endometrium implants from your body cavity. This surgery is proven to not be that effective. If you have really gentle endo, I've heard some people it helps them and that's wonderful, that's fine. But for the majority of people that isn't gonna do anything and it can actually make it worse. Um, the proper surgery is excision surgery. This can only be performed by an endometriosis specialist. I mean, every gynecologist who's a surgeon should know this surgery and be able to perform it, but that is not the world we live in. So you have to find an excision specialist. And an excision specialist will go in with scissors and cut the endometriosis out. Um, it's a lot more effective, like way more effective. Like, please only opt for excision surgery. Here's the problem. Excision surgery, it's depending where you live, hard to find a surgeon who does it. And insurance barely covers it. And I actually just was interviewed by the California Health Report about this because it is such a huge problem. We need the surgery. We're being mistreated. Um, by physicians, unfortunately, like they don't even know they're mistreating us, but they are. What we need is excision surgery um, because that is actually going to get rid of the endo, not just burn it and burn our insides. Who wants their insides burned, right? That's terrible. Um, the next thing I'll talk about with treatment is hormonal birth control, which I call the ultimate band-aid, right? You can't cure endo 
Excision surgery is the closest thing you'll get to a cure, but for some people, a hormonal birth control can be a great Band-Aid. And I'm talking about everything from the pill to the patch, to the shot, to the IUD, what have you. Um, I will just say a little warning here for those of you that do also suffer from migraines, hormonal birth control can make them worse. Just something to be aware of and maybe be talking about your gynecologist and to your neurologist as well. Um, <clears throat> because it can be a problem. But the birth control pill can help with like excessive bleeding. And some people, they get excision surgery and they go back on the birth control pill because endo is just that vicious. But those are two tools that you can have in your tool belt to try to live a more um, free life, right? Where we're not like the old ball and chain heating pad, right? And there's also diet. There's a lot more information coming forth and a lot of research about how diet can help manage endometriosis. There is a great um, woman, her name is Jessica Manain. She produced, or produced, um, wrote a cookbook called One Part Plant. And um, she had stage four endometriosis so bad. And she developed this diet, <clears throat> excuse me, this diet that can help manage endometriosis. And in my final slide, I have a bunch of resources for you guys. And you can like maybe write down her information if you're interested. But the biggest trigger diet wise and again everybody's different so you might have to do trial and error with this your endo isn't going to look like someone else's exactly the biggest food triggers are sugar processed sugar dairy dairy's the biggest one dairy red meat alcohol caffeine and gluten and from what i've heard and kind of read usually gluten and dairy are the biggest triggers but if you're really suffering i encourage you to cut out all the fun delicious things from your life and see if anything gets better. Acupuncture is another great resource. I go to acupuncture, it's helped me a lot. I encourage you though, again, if you're gonna see an acupuncturist, get someone who deals with gynecological issues, specifically if you can get someone who deals with endometriosis, there's a lot they can do to help you manage pain and fatigue. Um, and honestly, like we store so much physical and emotional pain in our bodies. Sometimes I feel like personally, they help get some of the emotional pain out. Um, which is always good because I think we carry a lot being chronically ill. Pelvic floor therapy is another good option. Pelvic floor therapy after surgery is always a great idea. A pelvic floor specialist, and these are covered by insurance a lot, so that's one good thing. Um, helps you strengthen your pelvic floor, which can help you with endo and help you relax. So a lot of us, like our abdominal muscles are like almost perpetually tensed from being in pain. And so they can help relax that, which can bring relief. And finally, I just want to talk again about mental health. If you are struggling with anxiety or depression with your mental health, I really encourage you to see a therapist or, for, or a psychiatrist and get that help because this can be very overwhelming and very isolating to be sick. I also suggest, you know, doing the gratitude practice. I meditate a lot, but there's a lot of things you can do to help keep your mental health up because um, this disease can just be, you know, absolutely exhausting and, like I said, really isolating. So I want to talk about my resources before I open the floor up to questions. I love getting questions, by the way, um, it's like kind of what I do for a living. So I want to offer some Instagram resources. So if you are looking to plug into a community, and I highly suggest this, or I am right, page underscore the uterus, the endo twins, they are hilarious, um, very informative about endometriosis. They have a monthly newsletter. They post all the time. They chat with you. It's great. Also, this endo life, she is a gal over in London. And she talks a lot about um, diet and lifestyle things to help you manage um, living with endometriosis. And she has like a website and a podcast. I was actually just on her podcast as well as an Instagram. And then Jessica, Jessica Murnan, um, Murnan, yeah, I was saying her name wrong, of course. Oops, I'm very dyslexic. Um, Jessica Murnan, and she is the author of One Part Plant. And I just think that's such a great resource if you're trying to handle things diet wise and sometimes it's like you need excision surgery and the pill and diet change and pelvic floor therapy sometimes this disease can be a full-time job and so I'm just trying to offer you guys all the resources I can um if you speaking of resources you can go to uterusuterus.com slash resources and I have a bunch of resources on there to, um, I have mental health resources, diet resources I have a whole um blog post on there about prepping for surgery because I've had a bunch of surgeries. I'm about to have surgery again in less than two weeks. Um, and so if you're about to have surgery, there's a, a bunch of good tips in there. And then there's Jessica's website and then the Endometriosis Foundation of America. So endo.org slash resource dash materials is another great resource. They are always 
um, compiling a lot of scientific evidence, which I find helpful because, right, we need more research and we need more just evidence to prove that this actually happens with a lot of, you know, your classic OBGYN barely knows about this, um, and also to raise awareness and get more funding for research. And the founder of that is Dr. Tamar Second, and he based in New York, and he is an amazing surgeon. He um, and the author, I should have actually added this to the resources, but he is the author of this book called The Doctor Will See You Now. The Doctor Will See You Now by Tamar Second. You can get it um, on Amazon. And I highly suggest it. It's basically your how-to guide for living with endometriosis. That book changed my life. I cannot suggest it enough. And I honestly cannot believe I didn't include it in the slide. Um, this is what high pain <laughs> does to you. Um, and then podcasts. I obviously have my podcast on here. But um, there's also This End of Life and One Part Plant. And those are great podcasts. I think podcasts are good, too, because then you, like, I listen to tons. And, you know, you're hearing about other people talk about this illness. and Personally, it makes me feel less alone, right? We're not the only ones out there. Um, and then let's stay in touch. I pretty much spend most of my time answering emails and Instagram messages and Facebook messages. Um, I will say that right now my migraine pain is extremely high. It's difficult for me to look at screens. And so I might be slow to respond if you guys do send me a message, but I promise I will get back to you. I'm also about to have surgery on Halloween, so I'm going to be MIA. But um, I'm planning to come back full force and we'll have another season of the uterus and the deuterus. Um, which is my podcast again in 2018. We have two seasons now available for free on iTunes. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go out of this uh, screen and then go ahead and go to the question and answer portion. And please shoot me any questions. I am happy to answer them. You can ask me the weirdest thing, the grossest thing. I honestly have, I'm not squeamish at all. I know sometimes those harder questions are the ones you really want the answers to. So here we go. How long did it take until you received your diagnosis and what treatments have you had? Oh, great question. So I um, started having endometriosis pain when I was 16. I did not get a diagnosis until I was 23. And I am, I've had two of the incorrect surgeries, two of the ablation surgeries, and I am hoping to get excision surgery in 2018. Um, but I see an acupuncturist, I've tried the pill, I've tried um, a lot of different things. Great. Okay. And our next question is, what was the inspiration be behind starting your podcast? Oh, um, that's that's a great question. I am, um, okay, in 2016, you know, I was incredibly sick as usual. And I wanted to start a YouTube channel talking about my disease just to like kind of give back to the community. And, but I was kind of too sick to do it. And so one of my best friends, Nick, who's a guy, he's like, Paige, I know you forever. I watch you get sick like let's do a podcast together and he and I are like have a very similar sense of humor and so it was actually his idea which is hilarious to me and then we just thought of the name the uterus and the uterus and we just thought that was funny we thought we were so funny <laughs> and then we honestly didn't think it would turn into anything but here we are <laughs> all right and our next question our next person says I've faced a lot of issues in my life after being di diagnosed with endometriosis, and I find that it holds me back from the things I want to do. How do I blow past that and still get to do all the things that I've planned for my life? Yeah, that's a great, great hard question and something that I honestly still struggle with, which I think that's part of the answer is struggling with that. So what I have done is I have made a list of things that I want to do in my life, and then I make smaller list of small ways that I could get to be able to do that or something close to that. And then I try to move towards that. I don't know if I'm being, um, for example, I really wanted to go to college and I didn't graduate until I was 27. And it took me a really long time to slowly get through school, but I kept going and I had to be on disability and I had to miss a lot of stuff. Um, but I try to make my mold, my goals into being more achievable. It's kind of a combination of molding your goals to fit the life of being chronically ill will also try to seek more treatment. And um, I don't know. Um, one thing I will say is I highly suggest reading the book, The Universe Has Your Back by Gabrielle Bernstein. I don't know if anyone's spiritual. It's not, this book isn't affiliated with any kind of religion. She's more about like the universe. Um, and reading that book was extremely freeing for me. And I was able to see ways that I am able to still achieve goals that I want, even though I am in bed a lot. Um, but
But I, I will tell you, sometimes it's a grieving process. Sometimes you have to be like, I simply cannot do this one thing, and you have to grieve it out. And then for me, like I asked the universe, show me another goal that I can be passionate about. And I talk about that sometimes on my YouTube channel as well. Because that's a hard one. I'm so sorry. That's a hard one. Yeah, thank you for that great answer. Our next question is, I have migraines and I have endometriosis, but I've never heard of a connection between the two. What does that look like? Oh, I'm so sorry you have both. I can say from personal experience, it's absolute hell. Um, so here's the connection. The big connection is hormones, right? Endometriosis is a hormone-driven disease. Um, and migraines are actually very hormone-driven. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but maybe you'll have, like, a girlfriend who has, like, a regular period, and she's like, oh, I get a migraine or a headache at the start of my period. It's because our estrogen and progesterone levels are changing. But when you have endometriosis, that happens in an abnormal way for prolonged periods of time. So a lot of your migraines can be hormone driven. That's why being on the birth control pill can hurt your migraines and make them worse because you're getting too much of the drug or the, the chemical that your body produces now artificially in your body, which makes your migraines worse. Um, and so if you're not seeing your neurologist, I suggest seeing a neurologist and trying to get on the preventive medication or works for you by having a surgery for it. See, even I used to have my neurologist and my gynecologist talk to each other about the issue to try and work on treatment for me. So you can always try to get them to talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Our next yeah, question so is a really great one. It says, at what point in a relationship should I tell my significant other that I have endometriosis? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think that depends on the context of how you guys got together. I've you know, dated someone who's been a friend before. And so because they've been my friend, they've known. And that's honestly the easiest way. Um, before you have sex, <laughs> I'm just going to put it that blatantly. Um, because for most of us, it can be painful or there can be complications. Um, I've warned guys before, like, oh, I'm kind of a grouch on my period. So sorry if I don't, like, text you back for the next week. You know, you can get away with that for a bit. But always make sure you're revealing something so intimate with someone who respects you and trusts you. Um, you know, it's easy to find yourself in a bad relationship. I actually just got out of an abusive relationship. And I openly talk about that on my Instagram if anyone else has been there. Um, and so just make sure you're putting up healthy boundaries for yourself. Great. Thank you so much. Our next question is, you come across very positive and strong. I struggle to feel that way when I have endometriosis. How do I become that? Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, honestly, like, it's, it's hard. I think one of the best ways I've become this way is when I talked about not judging myself. I mean, like, an hour before I did this, I, like, cried for 15 minutes on my bathroom floor. Like, I just, you just hit a wall sometimes. But I don't judge myself for doing that. And I think that's the most important part. Let yourself be you. And like I spoke about a little bit before, it's important to cultivate resilience in yourself. And that's why even when I, you know, when I wake up, I don't feel like meditating and journaling. I do not want to do that. I just want to, like, distract myself from my reality. But I meditate and I journal every day when I wake up. And I'm constantly reading books by, like, Brene Brown or Gabrielle Bernstein or people that are talking about being in a hard and painful situation and turning it into something else. I also rely a lot on my online community. Um, so, you know, follow me on Instagram, girl, and and I will try to show more of the way. I, like I said, I will be MIA because I have a pretty intense procedure and the recovery is long. Um, but um, you have to cultivate it. So don't give up. Don't judge yourself. Take every day a little bit at a time. That's what I would say. But it's hard. It's not easy at all. <laughs> and our next question is, how would you tell your HR department at work about your disease if you're getting in trouble with taking too much time off work due to endo pain, especially a male HR manager? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. The first thing is don't talk to your boss or your supervisor about it. Um, don't give them any kind of fuel. Here's some things you should do if you can in the first place. So so don't tell your boss or supervisor until you talk to HR. Keep a log of when you've been sick and if people have been treating you differently because you are sick or calling to work sick a lot. I know this might sound like paranoid, um, but I actually 
did an interview um, with a woman who works in HR, and she gave me these amazing tips. Um, and that will actually, that interview will be coming in the 2018 season of the Uterus and the Deuterus. Um, it's just not a, we just um, don't have our ducks in a row right now. But um, so, so keep a log of the shenanigans that happen. When you talk to your HR rep, I mean, if he gives you, I mean, you might want to record the conversation and tell him, I'm recording this conversation on my phone. If he gives you any kind of flack or anything, he's going to get in trouble. And I, and I hate just, you know, being like, be that annoying person, but be that, that annoying person. If your male HR rep gives you any crap for this, go to his superior, make a very public post on the internet and see how they deal with that. And I know that might sound a little aggressive and I used to not be this way, but after hearing countless stories of women being dismissed and treating, being treated horribly because of their disease in the workplace, I just don't think we can be docile about this. Um, when you go meet with your HR manager, talk about how you're trying to be proactive, be like, you know, before my period, you might have to say stuff like that. I get all this extra work done, and if if I have, you know, if I can go on disability or whatever it is with HR, I'm happy to communicate when I should be out with my superiors, um, etc. Legally, they can't fire you. Just heads up, in the United States, they cannot fire you for that. Um, and be just very open and clear. And hopefully, in 2018, we'll get that episode up of my podcast where we in depth talk about that stuff because it's very important. Great. Our next participant says, I just want to say how much I love your podcast and YouTube videos. They really help me. I listen to everyone, and you and Nick's off-topic conversations really help during those pain times. You had mentioned that you take a lot of pills every day. Could you explain some, such as the ones that your acupuncturist suggests? Oh, my gosh. You are so sweet. That is such a high compliment. That's like distracting people from pain is like the reason I get out of bed in the morning. Um, yeah, I can talk about what I take. So I take copious amounts of turmeric morning and night um, because that's an anti-inflammatory natural drug. Um, and I will say my body has a really hard time processing like pharmacological drugs, um, which is why I turn to acupuncture so much because I have like a stomach issue we're trying to figure out right now. Um, so yeah, I take a lot of turmeric because that helps with inflammation. Um, a lot of people take DIM, and if you're, you're going to take DIM, though, and that's capital D-I-M, you can buy it on the Internet, but be careful with that because if you take it for too long or too much, it can have negative effects, which is why I think it's always good to do that under the care of an acupuncturist. But that can actually encourage your body to break up scar tissue. It definitely helps me out a lot. Um, you can do, also do castor oil packs. Um, it's basically you take a piece of cloth and you rub – you cover it in castor oil and you put it over your abdomen and then cover that in saran wrap and then put your jammies on and then get in bed and then put your heating pad on. And that can also help your body break down scar tissue, which for us is just like a huge problem. Um, I take three different kinds of probiotics and one type of prebiotic and I take a ton of fiber. Like I talked about in the presentation, you know, constipation as well as diarrhea are very common. So trying to keep yourself as regular as possible and fiber can help fight diarrhea too. It's a counterintuitive. Um, but don't take too much because then you'll have like a different problem <laughs> where your body just like empties and it's horrible. Um, but doing that can help you stay on top of or, or you know, having less pain. Um, I also take um, a multivitamin and like a lot of um, like it's a multivitamin that has a lot of herbs in it to help boost the immune system because we do have weaker immune systems with endometriosis. And I don't know about you guys, but like if I get the common cold, I'm livid because I'm like, all right, I'm already chronically ill. I don't need this crap. I don't want the common cold. As I call it, I don't want a peasant disease. I want my cool disease. That's a joke, by the way. Um, so that's the gist of what I take, depending on where your body is at and what you need. Your acupuncturist might tell you to do something different. Um, and like, again, like I said, find someone who knows about endo because that's super important. Great. And our next question is, what are your thoughts on using CBD oil or medical marijuana to help with some of the symptoms of endo and migraine? Well, I'm using it right now. <laughs> um, I am very, I love California so much. Um, I use medical marijuana every day. Um, I think that CBD. So let me just get into the specifics here for people who don't know. Marijuana is made up as, of two main um, drugs, if you will. So there is the psychoactive component, which is the THC, and that gets you high. Then there is the pain-relieving anti-nausea, anti-anxiety component, which is the CBD. If you take pure CBD, 
you you won't get high. Um, <clears throat> some people have reported they feel high on CBD. So I'm just going to say, like, if you try CBD for the first time, maybe just do it at night when you're going to be at home. Um, I will just say as a disclaimer, marijuana can make people paranoid. It can make some people throw up. So if you're going to experiment with marijuana, please just be very careful. The, the good news is because we live in California, um, everything is like regulated. So you're getting stuff that's made for pain. So one of my favorite things is a brand called Maya and Whoopi. And that is Whoopi as in Whoopi Goldberg, which is awesome. She has endometriosis, which sucks for her, but it's great for us because she's made this wonderful product. She has this rub um, that I actually use today, and it's a balm that you rub on your body. You can get the CBD version or the THC version that can alleviate pain. They also, other brands have like CBD slow release patches you can wear on your skin. You can get tinctures, which are little droplets of just CBD. There are so many resources out there. And, you know, if you try one thing, it doesn't work, try a different thing. Go, I, I encourage you guys, get your medical, medical marijuana card, go to a dispensary and ask them, say, I have endometriosis, I have this pain, and I live up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and every time I go into a dispensary, they know all about it, and they suggest like a bajillion things. They even have vaginal uh, CBD suppositories. It's, it's a great time to have endometriosis. I don't know. That's probably not a funny joke. But yeah, there's a lot of resources out there like that. Great question. Great. Thank you so much. I think we've gone through everyone's questions. So I want to go ahead and thank you, Paige, for joining us tonight so much. I think um, everyone would agree that we all got a lot out of this. And I want to encourage all of our listeners to look at these resources that she's offered. Um, the video of this recording will be on YouTube soon. And um, our YouTube page is RMC Charitable Foundation. And it will also be on our Facebook page, which is um, Endo Family Support Group. And there you can find a lot of other resources as well. So once again, I just want to thank Paige and encourage all of you to um, seek out the different things that she's offered on this slide that you can see um, right here. And thank so, you so much for having me. This was great. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So we'll see you all um, next time. And thank you so much for joining us.